I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to. I give you praise. For you are my righteousness. Thank you, Father. I worship you. Almighty God. There is none like you. Yes, we come. Worship you. Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. privilege is ours to be able to come to the house of the Lord for two months we desired to come and all over the world people are still not able in Argentina they were wanting to start again and open the gates to his house and then they went back, went back, one stage. 
so they can't go. You know, we have taken for granted so long being able to gather and come into his house. Sometimes perhaps when the alarm sounded Sunday morning, we said, oh, we have to go. I wish I could stay and enjoy to sleep in. So easy to take things that are common for granted. Go this week, maybe not go. But you know, I don't know how long this window is going to last. Because this is not ending. But I know that today is our privilege. It's our privilege. To come and gather and see each other. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Father. We bless you. Thank you for the privilege of coming to your house today. Give us the good from your lips. Give us, O oh Lord, according to your will. Gifts from your throne to each one. According as you have prepared for us today. Bless every tribe, O oh Lord, with peace. Bless them, Lord. The husbands, the wives, the children. Bless every tribe that comes to your house. With your bountiful good, that as a father you provide for us. Thank you. Thank you for your provisions. Thank you for giving us what we need. Thank you for your protections from evil from harm. Thank you, Father, for you take care of us with your tender love. Thank you for your wisdom, your guidance. Thank you for being a strong tower to whom we can flee in times of trouble. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we bless you. Does anyone have something they wish to share? Testimony or prayer? What a lovely declaration. declaration. I trust you. It was a Job that said, Yea, though he slay me, I will trust. Wow, what a knowledge of his love. To say, I trust you in the midst of what he was going through. Wow, I trust you. Will not the creator of all things do good? Are you glad you're in the house of the Lord? Amen. 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 Today I'd like to speak about fathers, of fatherhood. Some information that I'm sure you must know. In the United States, Father's Day has been celebrated in June since 1910. 110 years ago. And other countries were inspired by America's custom of celebrating a Father's Day. And uh, because they were inspired, other countries like the United Kingdoms and many others began to celebrate Father's Day. And the date varies from country to country, but today in Canada and the UK, United States, it's observed also in Argentina, France, Greece, Italy, Ireland, Mexico, Singapore, 
Qatar, Venezuela. So we celebrate this day, Father's Day, is when we honor, and we should honor, our fathers and our mothers, because honoring them, our longevity is linked. It says if we honor our fathers, it gives us extensions to our life. And especially at this time when our founding fathers are being dishonored. And I will mention this a little later on in the message. It has to do with the health and longevity even of our, of our nation. We must honor those that came before us. If you look up what father means, it's much more than begetting a son or daughter. It's much more than being the male parent. He is a protector, is supposed to be a protector, is supposed to be a provider, a leader. According to our Heavenly Father, a priest in the home of the tribe. To look after, to care for his tribe as a father should. But today, this description would be challenged as being a stereotype. Who says the father has to lead the family? Who says the father has to provide? That's a stereotype. We need to throw out a stereotype. A stereotype is something that's always been that way. And in uh, the quest of something new and different, we, have, we want to throw out stereotypes of what a father should be, a mother should be, the role should be, even the sex it should be, the gender should be. The old is no good. And they want to change even what a father should be. That a family doesn't need a father. But the father is an image that God himself portrayed and demands of his creation that there be a father in the home. And that he should take on his role. There should be fatherhood as there should be motherhood. They're both important roles in the scriptures. Very important. But today, I want to focus on fatherhood. So just hold that thought about wanting to change the stereotype. As we continue, a father is also an ancestor. Our forefathers are fathers. The originator, the founder, the inventor is called the father of electricity, the father of biology, the father of science. The father of the electric car, the father of this, the father of that. It's given that name not only to a person in a family. Any man deserving respect or reverence because of his age or his position is called a father, even though he's not your physical father. The leaders of a city are called the fathers of a city. Of the assembly. We refer to the early Christian religious writers as church fathers, and they're considered authorities on the doctrines and teachings of the church because they were present at the time when the church had started. 
And they registered and recorded the doctrines of the apostles, the words of Jesus that were written. They made sure the preservation, so they're called fathers of the church. And as fathers, they should be reverenced and not worshipped, but honored. Priests are called fathers. One who takes the responsibility, they call him father. In foster homes, founding fathers, church fathers, our founding fathers of this country that did their best to leave us with a society that's lasted this long, but we have left their teachings. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks as a father. I think if anyone can be called a father of the church, it's Apostle Paul. It's not Peter. It's not the 12 apostles. Because it is his teachings and doctrines revealed to him by the risen Christ that have become the foundation. And he himself wrote this. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. And according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds upon that foundation. And today, we are living in a very unique time again in history. It's not the first time this has happened. It's happened many times, many, many times. Even in Bible times, that people want to change, revise. There's a thirst for new things, different things, of abandoning the old, the established, the stereotype, even what God has commanded us. And not only to build something different, as Paul said, but to go back and throw down the foundation upon which the whole building stands and want to start a new foundation, a different foundation. And we are living today again in history where there's a thirst for revision, a thirst for for doing something different, new, a new normal. To start a revolution, to find something different. When the old works perfectly for society and has kept society together and allowed us to prosper, but there is a desire in people's hearts, a hunger for revision. These are times when people are questioning the past. Tearing down even statues that represents the past as if that could change history. You can't change the past. What you do today might affect the future, but you cannot affect what was. You can't on, not erase history. They've managed to revise history that our children learn in school. By revising the history books, rewriting them, they seek out old letters written sometimes by the very enemies of our found founding fathers to write things about them, things that perhaps aren't even true. 
And so our children read that Benjamin Franklin was this. Washington was that. And they're dead. They're gone. They can't rise up and challenge. They can't say it's not that way. The history books are concealed. The real history books, you might find them in a library. But you probably won't find them available to read. Because history is being revised. And as I look upon this time, what we know is happening today because we're living it. You know what happened. I know what happened. We know what happened in these days, what's happening in these days. And because we have lived through these days, as we have lived through different times in history and decades past, I know what happened in the past of my life in the countries where I lived. You know what happened in the country you lived. And because we lived through it, we can write the history correctly. But imagine if people in the future, looking back, don't like the history that we have written, that lived through it, and say, that's not true. And so they research. And they write, they find all these writings preserved in social media. They see the transmissions of news, what we call fake news, exaggerated news, non-truths, straight out lies. And they say no because it didn't happen that way. It really didn't. Because see, here's the proof. And in their bibliography, in their footnotes, they put because CNN said this, ABC said this, CBS said this, the New York Times said this, the Washington Post said, who cares that little person that wrote that they, they lived through that. And easily they can revise history and says it wasn't that. It's a summer of love in Seattle. Of course, two people were killed a few days ago. But it's, it's dying of love. The police couldn't go in to get their bodies. They were taken out and taken to the hospital of the United States. They don't consider themselves. But you just happen to hear that. But the news doesn't tell you that, that people were assassinated. So we're living in a time of falsehood. You cannot change reality because it's true. Truth is eternal and truth comes from God. Jesus, his son, said, I am the truth. Truth is eternal, cannot be changed. You can choose to discard it, but you cannot change it. To build something different. They think it's better the combined knowledge of what people think and not what is. There's nothing original in this type of thinking. This has happened, as I said, countless times as people discarded God's ways, God's truth, God's commandments, and tried to create their own nation their own ways, their own laws. They even change their gods, God for gods that are not gods, for idols, and said, this is our God. Even shortly after God took them, miraculously out of Egypt, Aaron, himself the brother of Moses, during the absence of Moses, made a golden calf like the gods of Egypt and said, here people, this is your God. Trying to revise history. 
And the people said, oh, yeah, we like that. That's the God that delivered us. It's a golden calf. But it has never worked out. It always brought harm. It's never lasted. Revision has always brought about pain, death, and destruction. When we leave the foundation that God established. God has led this nation. God has led our founding fathers. God has given us this nation. He has prospered. He has allowed the nations to be established in the world. God's truth. God's foundation. And upon that foundation, we're not living like in the days of the Puritans or, or dressing like the Puritans. We are not going in horses, carts. We're going in lovely cars from here to there in transportation. So there's been a building upon those foundations. We're not in huts. So God has led the growth. But we have seen the laws have kept us. But when those foundations that you build upon, you destroy them. Proven foundations. Healthy foundations. Not only in our constitution, our laws, but in our family values. They're healthy. Those foundations should not be destroyed, but built upon, continue building upon the good. And it's true, many times, it's just a part of, uh, of the children to want to change things. The new generation, there's always a time of rebellion that they say, why does it have to be this way? I wanted to do it another way. They think they know better. But eventually, as they mature, they grow out of that rebellious stage and they realize the old man was, wasn't bad after all. I think he was right. Because life itself teaches them that the foundations were good. And that when they try another way, it goes bad. Proven ways, proven ideas. The prodigal son had this bright idea. Why do I have to work here in the farm? Yes, it's been here for generations. This land has belonged to our forefathers and their forefathers way back there because every jubilee it was restored to the tribe again. Even if the land was lost. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, that land that the prodigal son was born into had belonged to the family. But one day he got this bright idea. Why do we have to continue farming? Why do we have to continue taking care of animals? I got a better idea. I can do something better. So... He asked for his inheritance and he went out to prove his way was better. But we know the story. He realized soon that his experiment was full of pitfalls, full of errors. He washed through his money. And so what did he do? He returned to the established past. The firm foundation. And with time, his father died. And now he and his brother were left, not to abandon the farm, but to improve it. To make it better. You know, 
Every generation builds upon the generation that went before it. They stand upon the shoulders of the past. Even the so-called new discoveries have been built upon previous proven discovery and inventions. Just, uh, I think it was last week, or the week before, uh, Tesla announced that they were going to make a new battery that would last for one million miles for the new electric cars. And they were going to start manufacturing them. People said, oh, wow, what a tremendous inventor. And yet, he did not invent, inventor, invent the battery. In fact, their prototype was a result of many generations of battery going back 2,200 years ago when the first battery was known to exist. I think it was invented by the ancient Greek that we have been talking about these past two weeks. Because God enlightened them with knowledge in so many areas in science and medicine. They discovered democracy, laws. And it is not called the Greek battery because the battery they found is called the Baghdad battery because it was found in the city of Kajut Rabu, just outside of Baghdad, at the time of ancient Greece. So who knows, maybe they went and bought the battery in a battery shop in Greece, took it to Persia, and now it's called Baghdad battery. We don't know of any other invention that came from Persia. But as it be, that's when the battery was actually invented. That's the first battery, 2,200 years ago. Then, Alessandro Volti improved it. And he bettered it. And he discovered the voltaic pile, but even Volta paid tribute to the influences of those that came before him. Each one took a little step in developing the battery. And then in 1859, based on Volta's voltaic pile, which was one after another, In 1859, 59 years after Volta bettered the Baghdad battery, a French physician, Gaston Planté, discovered the first rechargeable battery for commercial use. 1859, the lead acid battery. It's still the same battery you're using in your car today. It's used in cars, wheels, chairs, scooters, golf carts, UPS system. And even though we've made so many advances in medicine to extend people's lives, we still have not gone back to the original foundation and perfect invention of God, the human body. Through medicine, we managed to extend life, and we know of people that are 100 years old, I think 110. God the Father, God the Creator, God the Originator, the first person in the Trinity, everything he created, he said it was good and perfect, which means no way it can be made better. The earth 
the stars, the sun. Who can discard it and say, we'll make something better? How ridiculous. God creates it perfect. A perfect machine is that body that God created. And a perfect fuel for that perfect machine. The fuel he created was the fruit of the tree of life. Literal life that contained everything needed to sustain and renew so that that body would never die. Perfect body that would never die. But when man was deceived by the serpent to try to improve God's design, and let me try this other fuel, this other fruit, this other thing. When he began eating this different fruit, it brought about a tragic change. The beginning of death. Slowly but surely breaking down the perfect invention of God, of the human body. And it took a long time for that food to destroy the body, it took 930 years. In Genesis 5 is where it tells you how long Adam lived. It lists the descendants of Adam. It lists how old they were when they had their son and how old they were when they died. And Genesis 5, 3 says... Adam was 130 years old when he had a son in his own likeness called Seth. And then after that, Adam lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. Adam lived 930 years. Even after eating poison. That's how perfect the body was. Now I'd like to direct you to the book of 1 Kings 8. In verse 17, God had made a design, a beautiful design of his house, his dwelling place, that he showed to Moses, and Moses built the tabernacle. The plans made in heaven itself. A building made in order that God was pleased to dwell in. But then came David along. He had a desire in his heart. And it was Solomon that told us about this desire. We know that David one day said, I want to build a house for God. And you know, Nathan the prophet came and said, God says, I never asked you to build me a house. And yet at the same time, that foundation, which was very temporal, that tabernacle which was built with wood, was covered with skins that had to be replaced because they would rot. with woven cloth that deteriorated and had to be renewed every so often. So David said, I have a desire. And God said, I didn't ask for it, but God did allow him to better what he had done, to build upon that foundation of the tabernacle. He didn't say, nope. I'm against that. You touch my design. That's it. No, because David would keep the most important things of what that design was. Because that design wasn't about the cloth. What that place was and the essence of that place was the Ark of the Covenant in a holy place. The table of bread 
the lampstand, the altar of incense in the holy place. The ark in the most holy place. And outside, the altar and the labor. He didn't change that or wanted to change that. He just wanted to build something, a structure a little more permanent. And so Solomon tells us in 1 Kings 8, 17, It was in the heart of my father David to build a house of the Lord God of Israel. And God said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house to my name, you did well. You did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you won't build it. He didn't say it was wrong. He said it was well to build a house, but you won't do it. But your son that will come forth out of your loins, he's going to build a house. And the Lord has performed by his word what he spoke. And I am risen in the place of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as God promised and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And I have set there a place for the ark of the covenant. And David brought all those implements Remember, he had a little tent where he had the Ark of the Covenant. David bought the land. God said, you're not going to build it, but he didn't say you can't build the land, can't buy the land, can't get the materials. So he did. God didn't say you can't make the plans. So David went and bought the land, the threshing Floor, you'll remember that story. He bought the land where the temple would one day be. Then he began to gather the material. He protected everything. He gathered everything. Everything that the founding fathers, those that kept the tabernacle, had built. The idea of building a house or how to build it was not his idea. It was a revelation given to Moses that was the father of the idea, the father of the tabernacle, everything from the altar and the ark, the cur curtains, the veil, the laver, the candlestick, had many fathers. Moses had the idea that God gave him. But he wasn't the father of the ark. In Exodus 36, 1, he says, Then... Did Bezalel and Aholiab build, and every wise-hearted man in whom God put wisdom and understanding to know how to work, all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. There were many fathers of the tabernacle. There were the father of the gold laying the father of the carpenters, all the carpentry, the father that built this, the father that built that, the father of the embroideries, the father of the, of the making of that cloth. And there were many generations between Moses and Solomon. And they tried to change to modernize. They despised even the tabernacle. They didn't go there anymore. They built their own houses of worship. In many generations, they tried to modernize God's house, invent sacrifices to other gods. And one day, we read that the most important artifact of all that was the ark, they lost it to the Philistines. And it was given back to them. Because everything went bad for the Philistine. They all got sick and had sick and had boils. So seven months later, please take it back. They returned it. But you know what? They didn't want it back. Because they were better off without it. Because that ark was holy. It represented the law. It represented what God wanted. It required holiness. It reminded them, of, reminded them of the law, 
of the truth. They didn't want the truth. They could teach what they wanted because nobody knew what the truth was. In the time of Josiah, somebody discovered a book of the law, and there was a revival. People found out the words of God. And so the Philistines gave back the ark, and they said, no, we don't want it. Don't bring it to Jerusalem. We don't need it here. And so they took it to a home, Kiryat Jerim, and there it remained in a person's house for 20 years. King Saul, he didn't want it. The people, they didn't want it. First Chronicles 13, 3 says that the people were not accustomed to consulting with the ark in the days of Saul. And in the past, the church has done the same. It has discarded what the church fathers built and made their own versions of church. They're still doing it now. They're building the modern church, the respectable church, the people's church, the cool church, the popular church. But they've done that all through history. They've discarded and built their own version, kept the ark far away so they could teach their revised version of Christianity. And for centuries, the church was in darkness as the world collapsed around them. But then, Martin Luther discovered the lost treasure and restored the history. He found the history book. He found what it was supposed to be. He found the teachings of the fathers. And all the revisions that had been made. And he wanted to restore history to its original value. There has been so many times when people have tried to revise everything. Now, they're revising the Bible so many times. Now, yes, King James Version is not perfect. But there's so many versions. And every version contains... A little bit of poison that has to do with the editor's opinion. So we have every modern translation that you read it and you say, where is the truth? It's been revised. It's been changed. So many revisions. And throughout history, God has come visited the church, restored again, torn down what man has built. Many times the church has had to go back to basics. Maybe this is a time, again, when God's church is being raised to the ground. Maybe this is a time that the church has to return to basics again. Maybe it's a time when churches won't be churches anymore. Maybe there's a time when God will bring everything modern down and, and make us go back to the essentials, to the foundations that are so sure, so wonderful. And every so often God has come He's shaken the church through wars, through pestilences, through situations. And he's made people have to go back to the basics of the foundation that Paul laid for the church. Even the time of Jeremiah... In Jeremiah 2.13, God told him and said, My people, they've committed two evils. They forsake me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This was way back there. Hundreds of years before Christ, people were doing this. Jeremiah 6, 16, thus saith the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old 
paths. Ask what the good way is and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk. People want to change the system. The system isn't broken. The people in the system are broken. The laws aren't broken. The people that interpret them in the courts are broken. The legislators, the House, the Senate is not broken. The people in it are broken. The foundation is good upon which God led our forefathers. The Constitution upon which many countries have basically copied the Constitution is not flawed. The people that interpret it are flawed. It's the people that have gone far from the original. The system is not broken. It's the people that say we don't want the system that was handed down to us by our fathers. We cannot change the world. And now on Father's Day, I want to speak to the fathers here and everywhere in the world. They listen to this message. We cannot and shouldn't worry right now about changing the world. But what we do, should do, is to go back and fix, if necessary, our world. Take back the principles that God has laid down for fatherhood. Look to our father as an example. We need to be fathers. We need another kind of fatherhood, an explorer, a discoverer who seeks out and uncovers the ancient treasures of the church and restores them. And as David began to collect, preserve those treasures and prepares the plans for your posterity, that they might look back at you as Solomon looked back as David and said, because of David, I have built this temple. He was the example. It wasn't his time to build it. But he did everything except build it. Fatherhood. Change the future. You cannot change the past. You cannot change the world, but you can change your posterity. You can leave a legacy as David left. All treasures seek out as David did his plans for the future of your generation. In 1 Chronicles 28, 12, Solomon said, God gave David, my father, the plans of all that the Spirit had put in his mind. 1 Chronicles 28, 12. Seek out what your future will be. And let the Spirit guide you in the, the things you teach your children your grandchildren, in the example you give that they will be led by. Yes, maybe even though they pass through a moment like the prodigal son of rebellion, the time will come when they will realize their experiment failed. Their life failed. And when it does, they will look back to the reference they had in their father. And they will say, I will return to the ways of my father. I will return to that which was solid. The Lord blessed him. Maybe if I return to those ways, he will bless me. Think about the posterity. Be a discoverer. 
Seek for him to tell you what to keep, what to seek, what to prepare, what plans. Write it down. Maybe you will be the writer of a book. Maybe you will lead, leave for posterities, for other fathers, something to look to, the plans. David said all this. Verse 19, I have written as a result of the Lord's hand upon me, and he enabled me to understand all the details of the plan. Seek out his plan. Let your heart desire, what is your plan, God, for my life? Maybe your future is not even in this country. Maybe it's in another country where your future will leave a legacy. Seek out his plans. Well, I'm comfortable here, but this might not be his plan. Seek out his plan. Prepare for the future. He enabled me to understand all the details of the plan. And so David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and courageous and do the work. Don't be afraid, afraid, don't be discouraged, for the Lord my God is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you until all the work for the temple, the service of the temple of the Lord is finished. He finished his work, wrote down the plan, prepared the materials, and left that legacy. And what a legacy it was. It was David's temple. And for centuries. And it was so beautiful that God said, I have a replica in heaven. I have a replica there. It says he even took the, the ark there. It's up there. John saw it. Yes, there is, there is a future, Father, for you. Seek it out. Seek it out. There is a wonderful plan that God has for you, Father. In Isaiah 58, verse 12, And they that shall be of thee, talking about posterity, shall build the old waste places. You will raise up foundations of many generations. What you do now affects many generations in the future. It lays a foundation for many generations. You will raise up that means digging. That means bringing stones. That means a purpose in life. What is your purpose, Father? What is God's purpose for you, Father? You build a foundation upon which many generations will build. And you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Let us be restorers of the ancient foundations that have been broken down. Families have been broken down. Fatherhood has been broken down. Motherhood has intertwined, intertwined or sometimes gone above fatherhood, lost their place, and given to their children a wrong future. Families have been destroyed because of the lack of fathers. Restore the breach. Take your place as a priest, as a father. Let us be restorers 
of the old foundation, repair the broken walls. Let us discover what is the path, the ancient path, the path that God's children have always walked, a path that has been forsaken, and now there's highways. There's paved highways where people zip here and zip there. But where is God's road? Discover. Discover in that forest overgrown by weeds until you find the ancient path that you can give as a legacy to your children and your children's children and your children's children. Be a restorer of the overgrown and lost ways in the jungle of modern thought and modern revision and modern religion. Women, accept God's plan for the home. Don't buy into revisionism. Don't abandon God's principles. Don't Pass the poison on to your children. So that family and home, as we see it in society today, has been totally corrupted and destroyed. Society today, today is an example of the failure of fatherhood the failure of motherhood, and the failure of family. May you fathers and all those fathers out there not only be restorers of the original truth, but you might also be a seeker as David of what God has prepared for us in the future. Be a discoverer of that new battery. Be a discoverer of what God has reserved, reserved for his church in this time and in the future. Be one of the founders of what God will do, a founder of the future church, a founder of the future society, one used as a founder of the new move of God that he will bring upon the earth. And may you be May you be looked back and say, this was the father of, the father of. My grandfather was the father, and we are following on his footsteps. My father was, God's given them the honor and the glory. Be a discoverer. Father, Restore in your church fatherhood. Restore, O oh God, in the Christian society fatherhood. Restore the families. Lord, allow us to be examples of that which was lost. Allow us, O oh Lord, to be examples to our children. Allow us to be examples to as many of the generations that will look back upon us. Father, give us the strength to be faithful. Give us, O oh Lord, to walk in your truth. Holy Spirit, guide us that we might not be contaminated by the lies of today's society. That we might not give up the battle. That we might not, O oh Lord, give up who we are, and who we were born to be. Lord, there are many that were born with a legacy. May they build upon it. May they not just preserve that legacy, but they might build upon it an even more wonderful legacy for their children and grandchildren. Lord, that our lives might be full and prosperous, and we might honor you. 
Thank you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity once again to be back here in your house. Bless every father. Bless every home. Bless every tribe I play. Pray in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen and Amen.